Take your coffee break with me. Come and take your coffee break with me. Come and take your coffee. Come and take your coffee. Come and take your coffee break with me. Hello and welcome back to Coffee Break with Candace. We're so glad you're here. Thanks so much for tuning in. I have a very special guest today. Uh, she is, I met her a couple years ago um, through a mentor mentee program. And she, I will have to say up front, she didn't need much help from me. She's incredibly bright, incredibly talented. And she's currently in her first year of medical school. And actually she's doing an MD, MPH program. I'm gonna let her Tell us who she is and a little bit about herself. Uh, my name is Belinda Basogi. I am currently a first year medical student here at McGovern uh, Medical School in Houston. I also am doing um, an MPH with um, the School of Public Health as well. So I plan on finishing in four years. But tell us how you decided you wanted to go into medicine, you wanted to be a doctor. Yes, I think definitely um, the cliche, like I knew since I was younger that I wanted to be a doctor. However, my idea of a physician definitely changed throughout um, my years growing up. I likely had my mom to look up to. Um, she became a registered nurse um, when we moved to the States. Um, just to give you background to preface it, is, um, I was born in Kenya. My family is from Rwanda. And then from there, we moved to Canada and I pretty much lived all over the East Coast. And then I ended up here in Texas. So I think Texas overall is my home. Um, but I was like lucky enough to look up to my mom in healthcare and she would tell me many, many stories about what she experienced at work and um, how she could see like just me being that leader in regards to healthcare. And she saw the little things I'll do with like toys or just like trying to help friends if they get hurt, like small characteristics that um, definitely like led me to research what more medicine had entailed. Um, but from there, I think just going through high school, going through college, I just fell more and more in love with medicine, the more I learned about it and just knew that I had a calling or felt like um, I saw myself making a difference in some aspect, whether it be as a physician or as a public speaker, but in some aspect, I don't see myself in any other field. So definitely just the calling of medicine itself is what led me here. So you said you're from Kenya, correct? Yes. So what what led you and your family to come to the, to, well, you said to Canada and, to, and then to the United States. So what led, what led to that journey? Yeah, so um, unfortunately, uh, my parents both were in the Rwandan genocide. So um, from there, they were able to find, um, ref, like, they went to a refugee camp in, Can uh, in Kenya. So... Um, I was born in Nairobi. From there, they were trying to find a better life for us. So we were able to um, live in Kenya for a couple of years and then to Montreal, Canada. And then we finally found our home here in the States. But yeah, Texas overall had many, many opportunities just to expand our family and just find a, um, a permanent home. So I think just overall with the, the war and everything, it was kind of hard to find um, just a stable home. But throughout all those like, um, places I was able to learn and just learn how to be an adaptable person and the experience it's, itself is a blessing in disguise so I wouldn't change that overall experience for anything else. So what about your experience you said made you more adaptable? Mm -hmm. um, I guess like for an example is like I grew up speaking French um, in Montreal, Canada so I did pre-k and part of kindergarten so when I came here to the U.S. and had to go straight to elementary school I'm um, just the social aspect and just becoming um, aware of how I may differ from my classmates and picking up on um, a different language at the same time, trying to translate for my parents. Um, at such a young age, I had to pick up on responsibilities, I guess, early on, not only as the firstborn, but just pick up roles that I guess a typical child wouldn't necessarily have to help with. So I think that helped me in regards to just taking um, responsibility early on and becoming more adaptable. Yeah, but that's actually, Belinda, that's pretty incredible. I didn't realize that, that you, um, so you're, so you spoke French and then you came to the United States mm -hmm. and learned to speak English. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yeah, definitely helped with ESL. So, so uh, how did you do that? 
Yes. Um, so when we came, um, they had ESL just for anyone who didn't have English as their first language. So I had to pretty much learn English through school and then through, I guess, like, honestly, just watching TV and like different things. It was I was pretty young, so I don't think it was as hard, I guess, as someone who grew up all their life <laughs> speaking a different language. But um, yeah, I think just overall learning throughout social interactions and um, school itself helped me learn English. Yeah, that's it. That's really incredible. So tell me if you can recall, what was one of your favorite TV shows that helped you learn English? Um, growing up, honestly, I watched a lot of Caillou. <laughs> um, I know Caillou <laughs> was always on the television. I don't even think it's Yes, it there. is. <laughs> <laughs> Caillou well, is on a lot. Yes, I have. <laughs> Yes, when my, um, he's, he's like a, a nephew to me, but he, what, Caillou was on, when I'd go visit them all oh. the time. I know, I Good. know Caillou. Okay, okay. Yes, it was my favorite show. <laughs> no judgments. I'm just like, I know Caillou. Okay, that's, but that's really cool. So that was one of the shows that helped you uh, learn English. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Was there another show or, or other things that you thought were particularly helpful? Um, I definitely feel like um, where we lived, I was able to, cause we lived in like an apartment complex. So I was able to um, have like a, a little group of friends that every time after school, we will just play, I guess, in our little parking lot. <laughs> so I think just interaction and social interactions through friends was a big impact in regards to like learning English and just the different slang words, I guess, or different like, social cues. So um, definitely that was helpful. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. So I know you said your your mom was a huge influence in terms of you deciding to go into medicine. Mm -hmm. But is there a specific moment where you thought I definitely want to be a doctor? I was in high school at the time. So um, I was able to do different camps and different um, things uh, geared towards healthcare to get me more exposure. Um, she was at the time working with the Dallas prison. Um, specifically with the mental um, unit. So she was able to see just like how prisoners were impacted in regards to mental health. And I think that hearing her stories like at the dinner table or things she just felt bad just seeing within our institution and just how um, a lot of, I guess, in prison, like a lot of people in prison didn't necessarily need to be there. Just the fact that mental health wasn't treated early enough um, kind of just made me feel like there's more that should be done in regards to like, of policy or regards to just, um, I guess, um, advocating for mental health. I know in specifically the black community, mental health at the time wasn't um, talked about as often as it should have. So I was like, there needs to be more done. So that was my main purpose of pursuing medicine, specifically mental health is what I am passionate about, so. Are you thinking that you're going to go into psychiatry? Or are you still deciding? Um, right now, I, I am open to other specialties, but psychiatry is my top choice just because I, I feel like there's just like the statistics itself, just having like 2% um, Black psychiatrists and then you have 13% um, African American within the US is kind of like a disparity within itself. I think there needs to be more representation within um, psychiatry and then just advocating for mental health, I know is a huge like step because the stigmas around mental health is like not so great. I think there needs to be more positive connotation in regards to seeking help early as like a, a regular routine, like you're getting a physical from the doctor. I think it should be important to get a mental checkup as well. Um, but things like that is why I'm drawn towards psychiatry um, over other specialties. Oh no, I think that's fantastic. And I think you're absolutely right. Have you ever have you considered some ways that we could address or destigmatize mental health, particularly in the African American community? Yeah, I think um, in regards to like the younger population too. I know like Black culture is a big thing, and like, I think the pandemic itself has made people more um, transparent in regards to like their own mental health issues. And I think um, just a lot of Black celebrities, um, I think, it will be helpful to have them specifically talk about their mental health experiences, whether it be with them or other people and their family or friends, just so it's a topic that isn't like frowned upon to speak about, I guess, per se. Like if you see like 
I guess Beyonce, uh, hypothetically speaking, talking about her experience or people she may know, I think more people will be open to just having open dialogue in regards to mental health. Um, I think just talking about it sometimes is the biggest issue. So um, hopefully like in the future, like pop culture, I guess, can normalize it or black culture in, in general could normalize the discussion. So I will say that one person that I know a celebrity that has spoken out about mental health and and her own challenges has been Taraji Henson. Like she is, mm -hmm. you know, she has done that quite a bit, and which I think really does make an impact. I've seen a lot in terms of Instagram where she's actually talked about it and talked about, you know, during the pandemic, you know, online mm -hmm. therapy and, and, you know, what's available, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, how do you and your friends talk about mental health? Not from a yeah, because we know you're in medical school. I know you have mm -hmm. that that side of you. But just as friends, do you mm -hmm. all have discussions about mental health? Yes, I think um, specifically just because I'm fortunate enough to go to med school with some of my best friends from undergrad. So, oh, that's um, great. We uh, like like I find out as a blessing this guy's for sure, because I know other people who came to med school um, this semester didn't necessarily know anyone. Um, and due to COVID being um, very active when we started, it was kind of hard to like meet our classmates, but we do know, um, unfortunately, there has been some classmates that we had to, um, I guess, pay attention to the red flags because um, quarantine itself and then going through online med school and you're away from your family was um, taking a toll on people um, more than, yeah, just more than in the past, you know, with the stressors of med school itself, but now it's COVID, now it's, um, I guess, just a lot of racial unjust. So it's a lot of external factors weighing in. So we are always checking in on each other, always making sure, like, if we haven't heard from someone in X amount of days, like, we have to go check up on that person just because we know people express their emotions in different ways. So we have to, like, just have open conversations as much as possible to make sure like we're not just balling, balling up in um, our feelings and emotions before um, it's too late per se, or before we um, just don't want anything bad to happen, I guess. So we always try to open up conversations and check in on each other to prevent anything um, from happening. And oh, that's fantastic. And let me ask you, so did you start online uh, with medical school or did you start initially in class and then transition to online? Um, so we definitely uh, started, I started my MPH in May. Um, so that was strictly online throughout the summer. And then um, in August, med school started. So that was online too. However, um, they, we were just basically this whole semester, we had to learn how to be flexible because no one, no one knew what COVID was going to um, bring or if it was going to go away, what have you. So they couldn't really plan far in advance in the semester. But as um, cases begin to rise, um, the only thing in person that was optional was anatomy. I think anatomy is kind of hard to just do virtually. Yes. Uh, so I think just that specific class is probably the most um, impacted by COVID because a lot of people do have different learning styles. So not physically seeing um, a cadaver could weigh a toll in regards to just how the human body is learned. So I think that was the most, I guess, um, difficult aspect of med school this semester is just virtually learning anatomy. But I don't, and I will have to say to you, having had anatomy class, having spent hours upon hour, hours with a cadaver and in mm -hmm. that lab, how do you do that? How do you learn on, you know, virtually mm -hmm. with, um, an, an, with anatomy class, with the anatomy lab? Yeah, it was definitely, I think, a big learning curve. I think online school in general is a learning curve. However, anatomy, I am a visual learner. So I think it was kind of hard to translate um, what we're seeing online and how and how it's like oriented or like where it is on the human body. So sure. I think that was the hardest thing to, I guess, um, figure out. However, I did, I was able to go in twice into the lab and physically see a cadaver, which was really helpful just to like have an idea of where I am in the human body, on the human body. But um, the test itself is kind of difficult because it's rather than going in and taking your practical on um, the cadaver is all virtual. So 
it's kind of hard to have um, that too as a test of the human body if that makes sense but um it's definitely it's going to be okay i think but it's definitely a learning curve <laughs> yes no definitely oh my goodness so, because i did wonder about that like how they would handle that and mm -hmm. doing that online does seem challenging because i'm the same i need to see it i'm a visual learner and so mm -hmm. i you know it, it just made a world of difference when i was in medical school to spend mm -hmm. time and learn on the body that way but um, it sounds like that despite the challenges, you know, you made it work. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it was. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We're almost done two more weeks. <laughs> OK, <laughs> so I have complete and utter faith in you, Belinda. Like I said, you just are an incredibly bright and talented young woman. And it's exciting to see you on this road, on this journey. And I'm excited to see, you know, you know, now, later, and, and, and much further in the future, um, you know, the things that you do, because I know it's going to be great. So I know that anatomy was, was challenging. What was a class that you found surprisingly um, adaptable to virtual learning? Mm -hmm. um, I would say foundations. I, so foundations specifically, is just like all our basic sciences and i um, just like the core, I guess, background book work of med school. Um, but that uh, having that online, just because most of the lectures were pre-recorded and um, we were able to do a self-paced in some ways, I think it was helpful for me because um, I'm not always the most prepared prior to lectures being in person. So like if I am in lectures, I can lose track of what subjects we're on or like if you zone out for a second, it's like, oh, I had to go back, but at least for this, I can re literally rewind and go back and learn at my own pace. So I think that was really helpful in regards to just school being online. So, and are you a person that studied with your friends prior to COVID or were you a person that studied by yourself? Um, I definitely I was a social learner. So I think that kind of was a bummer um, just because I had to learn how to really just study everything by myself. So um, I couldn't necessarily have those discussions with my classmates. However, um, we were lucky enough to have like some study groups and like organized through WebEx or through Zoom. So it was kind of like helpful just to discuss certain topics, I guess. But um, I do miss that aspect of social learning um, and just being in a lecture hall and having someone ask you questions you, you may have not thought of at that moment. So things like that is kind of, um, things I miss like that overall. I think it's great, um, you know, that you have been able to adapt to some of the challenges of COVID, you know, with, with, your, with your learning with, with medical school and, the, and your MPH program. Now, did you find that challenging at all, the MPH part? Um, it was actually, um, I think, beneficial in regards to just understanding, like specifically with COVID, what is going on and what actions um, in regards to like the government and healthcare workers and everything and how it's playing a part um, within public health. It was, it was kind of cool to learn about it during the summer and see what is going on in the news and what is going on in our environment right now. It's a lot of public health initiatives, a lot of um, public health workers taking the lead in places we haven't typically seen public health. Um, but I think in, it was kind of easy for me just because I did a public health um, program prior to starting med school so I was able to have um, prior exposure to a lot of these classes so um, I like public health I think it makes sense and then having that on top of medicine is something that I just find as a blessing so no I think that's fantastic I love public health as well so I think it's great that you're doing the you know dual program and that it was so applicable when you were mm -hmm. yes taking classes this summer that's incredible so you mentioned some of the, you know, some of the challenges of COVID with school and um, also, you know, the, you've, we've touched on mental health. What has been a personal challenge for you outside of the realm of medical school that you found this year with COVID, particularly mm -hmm. when it started? Yeah, I think um, for us personally, for me, um, just because I, I am a social person, I just like to have like school time. And then, you know, my break is like through interactions with friends and just, you know, I w was looking forward to exploring Houston as a city, heard many great things. However, when I did move here, 
Houston was having a high number of cases. So it was like we had to quarantine. Um, and also just meeting your classmates that typically is done through the first semester. Um, so we kind of had to miss like traditional things such as um, orientation. Um, usually they have like a camp retreat kind of ordeal, but we weren't able to experience that, which was a bummer. But I guess like through WebEx, we were able to meet our friends or our classmates, but it was kind of different just because like not everyone is, I guess, as personable on WebEx or it's kind of hard to have sure. that, you know, first interaction per se through WebEx. So I think that has been the biggest struggle, just finding out who's in my class or who could be my potential, I guess, med school friends or things like that. Absolutely. What drives you? What motivates you to work so hard? Um, I think just in general, just because I do generally love what I'm doing and just want to learn more about what I'm learning. I think it, I don't really look at it as like, oh, I have to go study again. Yeah, there's days like I'm overwhelmed with the amount of work, but I think just the fact that I know my why and know why my long-term goals is why I keep pushing myself. Um, also, like my mom would always say, like to whom much is given, much is required. So it's just, I think, just encompassing like good, healthy routines, good, healthy um, self-care routines. Um, I don't find myself overwhelmed, I guess. And that's a, that's incredible. And you talked about self-care. So what are some ways that you, you know, what are some of your self-care routines? Yeah, I, I definitely try to um, just keep the same routine in regards to the weekdays. So I try to like wake up at five. I've been trying to work out every day. It was good in the beginning of the semester, however. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Melinda. <laughs> I was like, I was quarantine, you know, I was gaining a couple of pounds. No, I'm kidding. But <laughs> I was like, mm. I might as well try while we have the extra time, I guess, just like have a mile run. But that didn't last over a month, but I think at least once or twice a week, I try to work out and then right. um, just having the same clean eating um, throughout the week. I do try to give myself one day off. So Sundays are like my rest days just because I think it's important to take a rest day um, for your mental health. So in regards to like self care, I'll do like homemade face mask or try new recipes on Sundays or just things like Ooh, that. <laughs> nice. So what's one of the favorite recipes you've tried that was successful that now is something you make on a regular basis? I, I love pizza as bad as that sounds. Wait a minute, okay. <laughs> what was about this healthy, I eat clean during the, I guess this is your Sunday meal. Pizza it's the rest Sunday. day, yeah. Okay. I, I'm just checking, okay. Yeah, self-care. Yeah. Um, self-care pizza. Yeah. So I, I try to like, you know, make, no, well, it's not healthy. I guess like I, instead of like uh, red sauce or tomato sauce, I put like Alfredo sauce. Um, I did like the cheese and then like the spinach, um, like tomatoes, red pepper, like I guess more vegetables on my pizza can make it healthier, but I've been liking to make my own pizza here, I guess, and just try Ooh, that different That sounds toppings. good. Well, that's cool. And so what, what advice would you give to someone who's interested in becoming a doctor and going to medical school? Yes, I definitely, if I, looking back still, I think right now more than ever, just because it is a lot more different than when I applied, I think just being adaptable and being willing to just roll with the punches, I guess, um, because at the end of the day, you know why you're doing this and you know your long-term goal. So like the short-term things that are happening, just um, know like when one door closes, another opens. I think I was disappointed a lot throughout the application cycle just because you expect things to go one way, but it will go another way. But at the end of the day, it's like, you'll get into a medical school. I think the hardest part for me per se was to get into a medical school. But once you're in, you know, you're here for a reason and you will just keep pushing and going forward and working harder. So um, just adaptability and flexibility was the biggest thing. At the end of the day, you are determined. So just keep that drive and keep knowing your why um, in regards to getting into med school. That's awesome. And so, and also you mentioned um, mentors. So would you encourage someone who's interested in, in medical school to, to seek out a mentor and be able to ask questions and different things like that? Mm -hmm, definitely without mentorship, I don't think I would have gotten as far as, um, I think not only mentorship in regards to 
I think for me, what helped the most was getting mentors at every level. So I had a mentor who was in med school, I had a mentor who was in residency, and I had a mentor who was a physician, you know, so I think it's having the different um, outlook and perspectives on what um, could benefit you is the best way to find mentorship. I think just being transparent with your mentors too um, would go a long way. So sometimes it's like, you may think you know something, but you'll be surprised just how much more you can learn from your mentors. So mentorship was a very pivotal thing in regards to where I am right now. I love what you just said too, is having a mentor at every level. Mm -hmm. And that gives you just even that much more um, expertise and, and good advice. We're gonna switch it up a little bit and now do my segment called Who Said That? Mm -hmm. Where I will give you a quote and a clue. And if you could tell me who said that, I will donate a modest amount to the charity of your choice. Okay, so here's the quote. There are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. And so I'll say that again. There are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. So would you like the clue? Yes, please. Okay. And so this person, who, the person who said that was a German born theoretical physicist who developed the theory of re relativity who I can't speak, who developed the theory of relativity, one of the two pillars of modern physics alongside quantum physics or quantum mechanics. His work is also known for its influence on the philosophy of science. He is best known to the general public for his mass energy equivalence formula E equals MC squared, which has been dubbed the world's most famous equation. He received the 1921 Nobel Prize in Physics for his services to theoretical physics and especially for his discovery of the law of photoelectric effect, a pivotal step in the development of quantum theory. That was a mouthful. I should have practiced <laughs> before I shared that with you. Like, wow, that was a lot. <laughs> I'm like reaching into the like. I, I know. <laughs> yeah, you um, are. You're reaching into the vault. <laughs> I, how many guesses do I get? One? <laughs> yes. I, I'll give you two because you're a hardworking medical student. So you get two. Okay. Because I feel like I should absolutely know this. Um, the theory of relativity E equals MC, MC squared. squared. Mm -hmm. Is it Einstein? It sure is. Okay. Yay! Yes! <laughs> ah! That's awesome. Yes. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that's, that's so awesome. So I, I will donate uh, to the charity of your choice, a modest amount. And Thank you so much. Oh, of course. It's so exciting. I'm so glad you got the, you know, you got the answer. <laughs> Who said that? Yes, Einstein. So no, fantastic. And so do you have any final words before we wrap up? Um. Thank you so much for having me. Like, I definitely, I appreciate your time and just like getting to speak to you more. But yeah, just thank you overall for having me on your show. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for everything you're doing. And like I said, I, you know, I'm so excited and proud of you and, and keep up the good work and you're going to do some great things. You're already doing great things, but you're going to do many, many great things in your lifetime. I have no doubt about that. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too as well. Thanks. Bye.